Long ago, there were two conflicting forces representing good and evil, light and darkness. Each force sought to dominate the kingdom they inhabited, leading to numerous wars involving both weapons and spells. The first force was comprised of ordinary people living among the populace, mortal like any human being. The second force, however, was of a demonic nature, not easily killed, and if they died, they would return to life after years. This force relied on magic in their battles rather than traditional weapons. As a result of these wars, people split into two groups, an immortal group that did not die, and another group, the good ones, who died like ordinary humans. After years of conflict, the struggle boiled down to two champions, one striving for justice and the other representing wickedness and evil. The fate of the world hinged on the outcome of the battle between them. Whoever prevailed would control the entire world. The righteous hero, seeking good, was named Graham. His goal was to rid the world of the evil brought by the wicked hero, the Lord of Demons, named Vliatel. One day, Graham went to Vliatel's stronghold, wielding his sacred sword that no one but him could wield, protected by extraordinary powers. When Graham arrived, he was surprised to see Vliatel wielding a weapon that matched the power of his sword. Suddenly, Graham attacked Vliatel, and the two engaged in a fierce battle. Vliatel tried to strike Graham with his magic, but Graham's sword deflected all the blows and protected him. Vliatel, enraged, decided to attack with all his might. After exchanging several blows, Vliatel found himself lying on the ground, his body covered in blood, while Graham stood firm in his place. These events occurred in the year 1599, in an era known as the Month of the Dragon. Suddenly, while Vliatel was lying on the ground, he said to Graham, Well done, Graham. You are truly strong. You have defeated me. Yes. But do you think it's over? No, it is not over yet. I am immortal, living forever, while you are mortal. You will live only a few more years. Keep your strength during those few years, and stay brave until you die. Graham thought to himself, Even the wicked perish, so why not say some kind words to him? He then said, You were also strong and brave. Fliatel wondered, Then why was I defeated? I was always stronger than all of you and no one could overcome me. I had plans and an army, and my power exceeded limits. So why was I defeated by you? Graham returned his sword to its place and said, You see, that is life. Liatel asked in bewilderment, Life? What does life mean? Graham replied, We have a life we want to live, and that makes you think we don't care about wars or anything else. But this life is what gives us the strength to fight you. Even if we die, we will die defending it. And when we win, we see the light of life that illuminates our path. Liatel questioned, The light of life? What nonsense is this? Was I defeated for something as trivial as this? Graham insisted. Indeed, you were defeated for the light of life. And I'll tell you something else. What made me triumph over you is the light of life that I always see before me. As Vliatel breathed his last, he said, Listen, Graham, as long as there is light, I will exist because I am the darkness that opposes this light. Whenever you see a light, you will find me on the other side, in the darkness. Because I am immortal and cannot truly be defeated, I will return again. Graham replied, All right, and I will be waiting for you at every light in my life. Vliatel said, Goodbye. The best and strongest enemy I faced in my life. Graham returned the farewell, saying, Goodbye, my wicked adversary, Lord of Demons. Graham returned home, having come back from a war and in need of rest. Life went on, and the world returned to its normal state. 500 years later, in the year 2099, Vliatel returned to Earth once again, accompanied by one of his old minions, Machina, one of his six aides. Upon Vliatel's return, he addressed Machina, saying, Machina, how are you? And what is this attire you are wearing? Makina apologized. I'm sorry for my appearance. I've been waiting for this moment for 500 years. I missed you greatly. Vliatel requested, All right, let me see you properly. Don't speak while sitting and drooping. Did you perform the spells to bring me back? Tell me, where are we now? She replied, We are in an underground metro station, so no one sees you in this form. Vliatel responded, It doesn't matter where we are now. What matters is that I've returned from death. Come on, Makina, join me. Makina tried to calm him, saying, Wait, I need to tell you something. We are not in the world where you died. You are now in a completely different world. Strange things have emerged, and many things have disappeared from the world we were in 500 years ago. Liatel was puzzled. What are you saying? I returned to seek revenge on Graham. Machina explained, About 80 years ago, our old world began to gradually disappear. Disasters and earthquakes occurred, and our world merged with Earth into one world. And these events were named Fantasian. Due to the disasters and earthquakes, 90% of humans died not to mention the wars. Governments abandoned their responsibilities, and everyone became responsible for themselves in their city. Each city has its own leader, and they went to war with each other even though they are in the same world. This resulted in many injuries and deaths. This is the life we live now. Something called technology has emerged, and new industries have appeared in our world as you can see. Once you step out of the metro station, you will see all these new things. Upon stepping out, 
Vliatel exclaimed in astonishment. Oh my god, what is all this? What are these things? Makina answered, technology and industry have merged together, and life here has become very fast-paced. You are now in the year 2099. What do you think about indulging your eyes in this new world? Vliatel shouted in surprise. What is this? And stepped out to blend in with the people, trying to understand this new world. As he was about to walk away, Makina stopped him, saying, Wait, where are you going? You might get lost here. This isn't your world. He replied, I'm just waiting to gather my six companions from the past. Do you know where any of them might be? As he looked up at the sky, amazed by the towering buildings, Makina asked him, What's wrong? He responded, These good people have no idea what I will do to them in the coming days. They need to be very cautious in the near future. Suddenly he decided to perform one of the demon lord's spells, saying, Humans, no one can do this but me. He raised his hand to the sky and recited a spell that split the sky in two. But strangely, people saw it and said, Who is this novice practicing magic in the air? What nonsense is this? Suddenly, the sound of police sirens blared, as the authorities prohibited such magical activities. Fliatel asked, What is this sound? You must not use your magic inside the city. It's forbidden. She began to pull him along and hide him among the people so that the police wouldn't see him. Fliatel protested, Why are you dragging me like this? I won't run away. They don't know who I am. No one can address me in this manner. Suddenly he spotted a strange figure that he couldn't quite recognize. They went to sit somewhere on the ground, and Makina began to tell him what happened with the good people after his death. They agreed to stop warring with them 80 years ago. But the Fantasian phenomenon separated the immortals from the mortals, placing them in entirely different locations. They deceived the good people and resettled them in small towns, while the immortals retained the large cities. She added, After gathering the immortals in one place, they decided to exterminate the mortals entirely. They treated them with extreme cruelty and made treaties to eliminate them as much as possible. Hunting them became easier due to the development of weapons in modern industries. They created weapons specially designed for immortals and produced many to eliminate mortals as quickly as possible. He asked her, Where are my six men who were with me? They've scattered, and no one knows their fate or if they're alive or dead. I survived thanks to one of them who hid me from the weapons and sacrificed himself to protect me. He told me he did it for Valentino, and because I and Rashlin were the only ones capable of bringing you back to life. Ah, I remember that great man. Throughout his service with me, he was one of the most loyal. He asked her about another person named Marcus, but she tried to change the subject by saying, Aren't you thirsty? I am. He replied, No. She said, All right, I'll go get us something to drink. Then she added, You've been asleep for 500 years and the air in this city isn't good. You must be thirsty. She rushed off to get water, avoiding answering his question about Marcus. Suddenly he saw a magic aura passing by him, and a faint light heading towards a girl playing with magic while standing on a tall building. He watched her using her magic on the surrounding buildings and screens, something forbidden in their world as they are state property. She was displaying bad images of thieves and foolish traitors on the screens, and everyone could see them, but only he and she could see her magic. She came down from the building, delighted with what she'd done, and he said to her, Hey girl, she responded. Yes? He asked. What was that I saw? What did you do? She replied. What are you talking about? I don't really understand. What do you want? He said. I'm telling you. I saw the light swirling around you. Then it gathered at you. And after that, you pointed your finger, and all the screens changed at once. She was surprised and said, Did you see what I did? How? From the light I had? Impossible. How did you see that? Who are you? He raised his hand with grandeur and pride. I am the demon lord. She responded in disbelief. Are you serious? Clearly not believing him at all. He replied, I know you did these things, and I'm sure of it, but I want to know why you're doing this. You seem to be an expert in these matters. She blushed and told him, I do what I can, and this is the least I can do. In truth, this is very easy for me. Surprised, he asked, how can this be easy? As he looked at her, noticing she didn't seem powerful or wear any clothes that suggested she practiced magic, she responded, forget about my appearance and clothes. In reality, I do things that could put my life at risk, quite often. Then she left and said, I am actually an expert in these matters, but what I did and what I saw just now is actually called exploiting the weakness of the screen networks you see in this area only. I control all the screens through their main device. These screens are the most important thing in the area because people watch them, are influenced by them, and get all the news from them. She added, that's why I brought content from the internet and displayed it on them. I don't want you to see me now as just a young teenage girl. I didn't do this out of arrogance, quite the opposite. The company responsible for these screens is not good at all showing untrue things and hiding the truth from everyone. That's why I've been at odds with them for a long time, and I display content from the internet, because it is the truth in the world we live in. Then she said, I enjoy this, and these are things I love to do in my daily life, and they are part of my work, because I find myself with people who do not accept the system in this corrupt society. By using my power to stop all of this, to inform people about the truth, and also to prove that these screens are part of the corrupt system, and because I am so beautiful and wonderful. But the Master of Darkness didn't care about all of this, and said to her, 
I tell you, I want to ask you about a person here in your world named Marcus. Have you heard of this name before? Maybe he is the owner of the largest tower over there. The CEO of this company is named Marcus. Maybe that's him. Then he left her and went to the company to ask about Marcus. He met a humanoid robot and said to it, Tell Marcus that I am here. He found Marcus's secretary waiting for him, and she said, We have been expecting you for a long time. Where have you been, man? He looked at her because of her clothes and something hanging in the pocket of her jacket. He asked, What is that then? She replied, This is the symbol of the company we work for and earn our livelihood from. And not only this, but we'll expand and develop it a lot in the coming days. He said to her, It looks like a strange symbol. And as soon as Marcus saw him, he said, How are you, king? What's up? It's been a very long time. Philtol replied, How do you just sit there upon seeing me? You're disrespecting me greatly. Stand up when you talk to me. Marcus paid no attention to his words and said, Why did you come here today? What's the reason for gracing us with your presence? He replied, Man, I thought you'd throw a party since I'm back, and you'd welcome me with open arms. I didn't expect this from you. Marcus responded, Ah, that was in the past. Not now. Now. So he said, okay, let's leave that aside. I came to you about something more important than all this now. He asked for Marcus's help to bring the immortals back again, to control the world as in the past, and to try to become the first ruler of the world. Marcus looked at him while he spoke, and laughed at his words so much that it brought Philtal to a state of intense anger. After he finished laughing, he said, of course not. Philtal said, what are you saying? How dare you defy my orders, boy? Marcus answered, as I told you, no, my king. Then he added, no, you are not my king. He addressed him by his regular name without any title. Philtal said, Now you're calling me by my name and mocking my words? Fine, I'll show you. He suddenly found Marcus's secretary pulling out a sword from her side and defending her boss. He said to her, You also know how to wield weapon magic? At this point, Marcus asked her to step back and not hit him any further, or engage in a battle with him. She said, As you command, sir, and walked away. Philtal noticed as she walked that she had the same device on her upper back as Manika, which seemed to be present with many people in their world, a device Marcus apparently used to control them. Marcus continued speaking to him, saying, You've become so weak. You get injured from the slightest thing. Even your wounds don't heal as they used to. You used to not shed a drop of blood, and your wounds would heal immediately. And you tell me you came to take over the world and want me to join you? Stop making me laugh. The things you had and the power you possessed in past years are a thing of the past. The times we live in now are different and I will never bow to someone as weak as you. I can kill you easily. Go on, take yourself and leave from here. I don't want to see your face again, but perhaps I'll change my mind if something happens. I will be your leader and your sultan, and you will apologize and say to me, forgive me, I am sorry, and then I will be with you. Or rather, you will be with me serving me. Philtal didn't remain silent. He bared his teeth and said, it seems you have forgotten the past. You cannot defeat me. I am the lord of the demons. Marcus replied, try if you can and show me what you will do. As Philtal was about to cast a spell, Marcus stopped and broke all his spells, meaning he wouldn't succeed in doing anything against him. Marcus said to him, You have become slow and I am faster than you. Philtal responded, How is this? We were not like this in the past. How did this happen? Marcus laughed again, but this time louder, displaying signs of victory over his old master. Then he said, Of course you are asking yourself now why you can do nothing against me, right? And you're wondering why your magic is no longer as strong as it was. Meanwhile, I, who knew nothing about magic, can bind you from every side and not give you a chance to do anything. That's what you are thinking right now, isn't it, Lord of Darkness? Marcus said this with clear mockery, using the title Lord of Darkness sarcastically to show how the balance of power between them had changed. Marcus continued, Do you know the reason I am superior to you? It's this device I wear on my body. His old master asked curiously, What's the story of this device? I've seen many people wearing it on their backs. Marcus displayed a demonstration video on the screen and explained, This device is called Familia. It enhances human capabilities makes them faster than their natural abilities, and allows them to perform multiple tasks simultaneously. It also aids in construction, expansion, and the use of spells. Those who wear this device can use magic freely. It can be fitted to animals as well, suitable for all ages. Its users don't need to speak spells. By thinking, their desires materialize. Marcus added proudly, I designed this familia, and I deliberately made it incompatible with the bodies of immortals like you. So forget about ever becoming like me. If you try to implant it in your body, you will suffer a lot. The Lord of Darkness tried to use a spell against Marcus, but the device was too powerful and broke the spell. Marcus commented mockingly, I've healed your arm, but the familia is much faster than you. It has become an indispensable necessity. If you don't have one implanted in your body, you will become very slow compared to others. The Lord of Darkness said to Marcus, why did you do this, Marcus? Marcus replied, You keep asking me why. You think I was just your servant. I never liked you or serving you. You were always arrogant and thought you were the strongest among us. My reasons for hating you were your
your arrogance and the belief that you're the only one who matters. I endured serving you with difficulty, and people hated me because of you. The Lord of Darkness said, I never saw your true self and was deceived by you. Marcus replied, Well, now you understand. Okay, go now because I'm not available for you. I have a lot of work. Marcus then struck Philtal with arrows on his body from the 30th floor of the company. After that, Marcus considered himself the new Lord of Darkness, and called his secretary to inform her of this. The secretary asked the manager, What will we do about the advertisements and the new development? He said, Let's have a meeting to discuss that. As Philtal walked down the street, he was saying to himself, I'm recovering very slowly. What's happening to me? He tried to find someone to help him and bumped into someone saying, Are you blind? How do you bump into? The person replied, Are you crazy? What are you saying? Meanwhile, Makina heard the sounds of an argument from afar. She found him lying on the ground saying, What's happening to me? I've become so weak. Makina took him to her home and said, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you about Marcus's betrayal and what he was doing. He replied, Even if you had told me, I would have gone to see what happened with him. As they approached the street where she lived, there was a large house. When Philtal saw it, he said, That house is quite big. Makina told him, No, that's not my house. The small house is mine. He laughed and said, You must be kidding. That's a room, not a house. She said, No. That's my home. Things haven't been going well these days. The Lord of Darkness said to Makina, You are one of the people who have influenced me, and you were a loyal servant. I will make it up to you for all that. Upon hearing this, Makina cried tears of joy and said to him, Your words are the most beautiful thing I've heard, and I'm very happy to hear them. Then she threw herself into his arms, expressing her gratitude and happiness at his words. After that, we find Makina dreaming, recalling memories of when she was unloved by her people. They tried to kill her by throwing stones and tossing her into the fire. Fleetal appears at that moment and saves her, saying, You're fine and beautiful. Come with me to my kingdom. She reaches out to him, and suddenly wakes up to the sound of the alarm, finding Fleetal sleeping beside her. Makina gets up to prepare breakfast for Fleetal, and chats with the familiar device, asking about the weather and her condition. After finishing the meal preparation, she goes to wake Fleetal, saying, Here you go. Breakfast is ready. Fleetal wakes up and expresses his surprise, saying, This breakfast looks strange, but it smells and looks good. I'm sure it'll taste delicious. He starts eating and comments that it tastes great, which makes Makina very happy. She then pours him some tea. Fleetal asks Makina if there are any other people like them still alive. Makina replies, I don't know. Since they were hunting the immortals, they disappeared. Fleetal asks, Are they still hunting immortals? Makina answers, No. That ended a long time ago, and people don't talk about it anymore. They gathered the immortals in the Marcus building, but a war broke out with them. Since then, I haven't seen any of them, except for a word written with everyone who dies. She hands him a paper with the immortal oven written on it, which Fleetal reads with curiosity. He tries to drink the tea but spills it due to wounds that haven't healed quickly. Fleetal couldn't hold the teacup, which made Makina worry. She asked, Are you okay? He replied, My strength has weakened compared to before. Makina responded, It's because we're in this modern era. New things have appeared. Fleetal added, Also, people don't believe in me like they used to, and no one knows me now. If everyone believed in me, I'd regain my strength and be able to control things again. Makina said, You're now part of history for this era. He replied, It doesn't matter. I'll return to how I was. Then he fixed the spilled tea and said, I have primal power, and I'll regain my true strength. I'll search for the immortals in the entire area. Makina asked, Can you do that? He said, Yes. It'll be part of my daily routine better than staying asleep with pain in my body. Makina suggested, how about going to the market with me to buy some things? Fleetal agreed. When they entered the market, Makina said, first, we'll buy new clothes for you, instead of what you're wearing now. They entered a clothing store, and Makina tried to take Fleetal's measurements, saying, I'll try my best to find good clothes. Fleetal replied, it doesn't matter. I can wear anything, even if I'm without clothes. Makina responded, no, people outside don't deserve to see your body at all. Fleetal agreed saying, you're right. Makina used her familia device to select the best items at a reasonable price. The familia responded, these are the best options for him. At that moment, Fleetal chimed in, saying, this is great and suits me perfectly, adding, I really like this. When he asked, what's written here? Makina replied, it says Dark Lord. He said, good. Fleetal asked, aren't you going to pay? Makina responded, I paid automatically without cash. He was surprised by this. Afterward, they headed to a restaurant, and Fleetal asked Makina, tell me more about the familia. It seems Marcus loves and understands it well, but I want to know what it is. Makina explained, it's comfortable and easy for humans to use. It helps them use magic and simplifies daily life for shopping and communication without needing to carry any device. She clarified that there was a similar device they used before, 
but the familia surpassed it, so no one needs it anymore. Fleetal said, I want to touch it. Turn around here. Machina felt embarrassed and said, that's not possible. She thought to herself, how can he do this in front of people? But then she reconsidered. It doesn't matter. Everything he says goes because he's Prince Fleetal, and I can't refuse. Then the familia appeared and said, heart rate is very fast and blood pressure is high. Makina replied, it doesn't matter, stay as you are. Fleetal finished by saying, I'm done. Makina asked him, did you just want to see it? He answered, yes, I saw it. Then Fleetal asked her, don't you feel uncomfortable? Makina seemed genuinely sad. Then Fleetal asked Makina when he saw her putting the familia on her back, does it hurt you? She replied, only at first, but then I got used to it. Fleetal was surprised and asked, how did you get used to it? Makina answered, everyone here is used to it now and no one can live without it. However, it doesn't greatly improve human life. They went to an abandoned place, and Makina asked him, where are you going? Fleetal replied, I'm going to look for a job. Makina responded, no, of course, I can take care of you more and work more to bring you what you want. He answered, listen, times have changed from the past, and I can't stay without doing anything. I must change with the times, and I won't allow you to work alone to provide clothes and food for me while I sit. Fleetal added, as long as I'm not a king now, I must work. He continued, I'm telling you again that I want you to listen to me and be in my service as you were before. Makina sat down and said, I am at your command and will continue to serve you until the last day of my life, as long as you're alive, and I dedicate my life to you. Fleetal was wearing the new clothes he bought, with a device in his hand, and said, it's a strange feeling. He remembered the situation when Makina was worried about him like small children, her desire to go with him to look for work, and her reluctance to leave him alone. He told her, no, I'll go because you have work. She replied, no, I'll cancel it. Fleetal responded, if you cancel it, where will we eat and drink from? I'll go back to eating and dressing at your expense again and living off your money. She told him, take this device, it has some money in it. If you feel hungry, buy food. And if you want to contact me, you can also locate me. He replied, okay. At one point, Fleetal sat alone and said, I'm not a child, but I also don't know what kind of work I can do that suits me. I'll ask Makina for help. Then he said to himself, no, I'll rely on myself. Feeling disappointed, he said, the last time I ate was a while ago. Next to him was a person on his left talking to himself and another on his right, a beggar asking for money or food. He stood up and moved away from them, then stood in the middle of the street and shouted, I want a job. Is there anyone who can employ me? I can do anything and work anywhere. The person who was talking to himself approached and said, What are you doing? Fleetal replied, I'm looking for a job. The person told him, Then go to the employment office. Don't you have an ID card? Fleetal asked, What's an ID card? The man responded, Are you an immigrant from somewhere else who came without papers? Then you won't be able to do anything here. Fleetal said, I'm sorry for bothering you. I'll go now. The old man said, Wait, take this notebook with you and write down your previous workplaces and skills. Although I don't feel you have experience in anything, but keep it instead of going without anything. He pointed to the location saying, The employment office is in that building on the fourth floor with an orange sign. The old man warned him, Stay away from any company called HMI, because they work in construction and buildings, and they're very bad to deal with. Fleetal thanked the old man, saying, Thank you very much. He went to the employment office and told the clerk, Ask me freely. I won't hide anything from you. The clerk began asking, You wrote that you're good at Della Assel Doctor. Fleetal replied, Yes, I'm very skilled at it. The clerk inquired, And what is that? Fleetal said, It's a spell that keeps monsters away from your land and kills them. The clerk looked at him suspiciously, as if wanting to say he was crazy. Then the clerk moved on to ask, Okay, you say you're good at physical fitness and military matters. Fleetal answered, Yes. I'm good at all of that, and I can also be a great army leader. He began recounting his past adventures and wars, saying, These things are small compared to what I used to do. I put them in my papers. The clerk read the paper a little and then said, You wrote that you were a country leader 500 years ago, or did I read that wrong? Fleetal replied, No, that's correct. I actually did that, and I was a king with my army, and people lived very well under my rule. The clerk said, Okay. Fleetal talked about an ancient war, and asked the clerk, Haven't you heard about that war? The clerk apologized and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Fleetal, but I can't provide you with a job because there's nothing in your experience indicating you've worked anywhere before. Secondly, because we don't employ those who don't have a familiar device. Fleetal returned to Makina, lay on her lap, and told her he couldn't find a job, that he won't be able to do anything like other people, and that he feels less than them. Makina replied, don't say that, and don't be sad. I know you're a hero, and they're the ones who don't know your value or who you are. He got up from her lap and said, I don't know what to do. He asked her, don't you know anyone who can help us? Makina answered, yes, I have a friend you know, she can help us. Makina contacted her and told him, she'll meet us at the restaurant now. They arrived at the restaurant, and her friend came and said, how are you? Fleetal realized he had met her before and told Makina, I know her. The girl replied, yes and I know him. He was, the girl said, he was bothering me. Makina responded, you deserve it because you're beautiful. The girl introduced herself as Takashi and asked Fleetal for his name. 
which he provided. She said to him, You're the flea tall that Makina talks about, the dark lord who will take her to another place far from here. And Makina intervened, saying, Watch your words. Flea tall said, It doesn't matter because we need her. Takashi replied, Okay, you're my friend's friend, so you're my friend now too. At this point, Makina felt uncomfortable and said, Stop talking for a moment. Takashi apologized, and Flea tall asked, Have you two become friends? Takashi replied, Yes. We met before in a chat room and talked for a while. Since then, we've become friends. Fleetal noticed her familiar device and put his hand on it. Takashi asked, What are you doing? She turned to Makina and said, Is what he's doing okay? Makina responded, He's done that to me before. So what's the difference for you? Takashi answered, It's none of my business. Fleetal apologized, I'm sorry, but I found her different from others, so I thought of mimicking her. Takashi replied, It's fine do as you please. Makina then said, Mr. Fleetal can create anything just by seeing or touching it. Takashi said, that's why I saw the hack you did on the screens. Fleetal responded, I know a lot about Familia, but there are things I haven't fully understood yet. Makina said, we need to talk about our current situation. She explained to Takashi that Fleetal wants to work. Takashi replied, he can go to the employment office. Fleetal said, I went, but they rejected me. Takashi asked, don't you have a Familia? He said, no, there are reasons preventing me from installing it. Takashi was surprised, and Fleetal said, I want your advice on where to work, and I want people to know me and make my name famous. Takashi thought about how she could help him work without needing Familia and become famous quickly for everyone to see. Suddenly the restaurant worker turned on the TV to a popular show, and people were watching it eagerly. This gave them an idea. Fleetal then went to try working and actually started gaining fame. He introduced himself at his first event saying, With you is the Lord of Demons Fleetal. How are you all doing? Takashi proposing to Veltal to work as a television host. He responds with surprise, asking, A host? Takashi replied, Yes, a host. They earn good money from donations and views and also make people happy. Veltal asks, So it's an easy job? Takashi responds, Yes, very easy. Also, in the future, when you have money, you can buy better equipment. However, Makina refuses the job, stating that she doesn't approve of Mr. Veltal working like that. Takashi tells her that her thinking is outdated and that Veltal has a nice voice and will do a good job. Makina retorts that she knows this very well. Takashi continued her point, saying that even if Veltal doesn't know how to use family games, he can still use older games. They then ask Veltal for his opinion. Veltal admits that he doesn't have many options, so they would rely on Takashi's idea. Makina shows some signs of skepticism, but eventually agrees. Takashi was very happy with this decision. Veltol tries to discover more about his new job by browsing on his phone, realizing that his work is the fastest way to reach people's minds. He observes that most people don't have enough information about life, making it difficult for them to progress. To them, freedom means different things, like indulging in excess and not following the city's laws. In a way, this could allow him to control the world again. Makina comes out of the bathroom without wearing her clothes, and Veltol sees her in surprise, she quickly puts on her clothes and goes to apologize to him. Veltal asks her what she is doing. Makina says, I apologize for what happened. I used to live alone, and I've gotten used to solitude. Veltal reassures her, saying, It's alright, there's no problem. Your body looks like that of one of the six warriors. Then we see Takashi bringing games that Veltal will train on, and Makina says, I'm not reassured. Takashi replies, We've been friends for a long time. Why don't you trust me? Veltal sat on the chair and started the first game for training. Takashi said it was one of the hardest games, and many people can't win it but she believes he can win. When Veltal tried his luck for the first time, he lost the game. He tried multiple times but couldn't win, and he admitted that the game was hard for him. Takashi told him, you are bad at the game. Veltal responded that it didn't matter because he doesn't adapt quickly to magic games. Takashi pointed out that while he may not have mastered the game, he knows how to use it. Veltal replied, yes. Makina asked if Veltal's chances of learning quickly were weak. Takashi confirmed, yes, but that's okay. Veltal will combine his beautiful voice with his good looks and skills. Makina was surprised when Takashi mentioned that Veltal's skills were good. Takashi said, now we need to prepare a good introduction for people to get to know him. Makina asked, is this important? Takashi replied, yes, it's the most important thing. Veltal inquired, do I need to introduce myself with my old true personality? Takashi responded, no, and asked, why they underestimated her work. There are five million people doing things like this, and not a single person can live as they want. Surely, Mr. Veltol, you don't want to live off Makina's expenses. That's why you need to find some good words to kick off the broadcast so that many people will follow you. Veltol asked Makina if she had any ideas. She said, Actually, I suppose some phrases you used in old wars would be good. You can try one of them. Veltol then stood up and recited one of his old phrases from the wars. When he finished, Makina greeted him after this phrase, but Takashi didn't like the situation and said, We're on the right track. 
but not in this way or style. Takashi informed him that she would teach him the basic fundamentals for this stage. First, we will broadcast daily for the longest possible times. This is the most important and difficult part. When you enter the broadcast, you should talk more about the game or exciting external topics to attract people to your stream. She warned him that any inappropriate comments would lead to a long ban from the broadcast. Takashi then asked Makina to remain silent and completely quiet when Veltol starts the live stream so she wouldn't be caught on camera. We see the number of listeners to Veltol's broadcast increasing, and Takashi also helps him by giving money to some people to follow him, thus increasing his follower count. Some followers were mocking Veltol, but he welcomed them graciously, telling them he enjoyed it and that it didn't upset him. Makina asked Veltol why he didn't get angry when they spoke to him like that. Veltol replied that he accepted criticism, whether good or bad, as it benefited him greatly. At this point, Makina expressed her dissatisfaction with the situation due to the reprimands directed at Veltol and that she felt sad for him. Veltol told her that anyone who speaks with criticism or praise has the right to do so. After all, they are viewers and should not be monitored. Here, Veltol's follower count reaches 1 million. He starts his broadcast, informing his audience that he will play again and defeat the monster that night. Meanwhile, we see Makina returning home from work, and there is a camera filming her from above. When she enters the house, she finds Veltol playing with his followers, and he announces that he has won the game and will end the stream, reminding them not to forget to follow him. As Makina walks in, Veltol closes the stream, puts on his clothes, and tells her that he is going out for a bit to walk around the city. Makina informs him that she will prepare dinner for him when he gets back. We notice that Veltol encounters his rival, Garam. As he looks at Veltol, he starts to remember what Veltol and his army did before particularly how Garam had a sick sister and went to get medicine for her. When he returned home, he found that Veltol's army had burned his house down, killing his father, mother, and sister. Veltol invites Garam to a restaurant for a meal and assures him that this restaurant is one Makina recommended and that it is one of the best in the city. Veltol also tells him that food during this time is much better than it was in their past. The waiter brings their food, and Garam remarks, I can't believe I'm eating next to the man who burned my house and caused my family's death. Veltol responds, I also can't believe this. After all, you killed many of my men, but I feel no anger towards you. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Veltol continues, I have a question that puzzles me. What brought you here, and how have you managed to stay alive for so long? Have you become immortal? Garam takes a bite, but doesn't answer. Veltol then says, When you fought me and defeated me, you told me that your life isn't permanent, and that you'd be dead at some point. Garam replied that when he died, the witch Meldia granted him the full youth spell which has nothing to do with eternal life or immortality. They are very different concepts. Veltol told him that Meldia loved him very much but also hated their time, and expected her to do something foolish like this. Garam goes on to explain that there were many wars after the War of the Immortals, battles against the mortals, and he was called to the battlefield to protect the world, killing many mortals. Then the wars of the immortals came, and they also had to hunt them down, killing a large number of them as well. Garam asked Veltol why he wanted to control the world. Veltol replied that he wanted peace for the world, and mentioned that there are many ways to gain immortality, like spells and searching for magic. He pointed out that every immortal will die someday. In the past, Ordinary people called them names like the Dark Ones, but they are all quite similar. Nevertheless, all the mortals opposed them and mocked them. G told Veltol that the immortals also have mocked them, trying to control and attack them. Veltol agreed, saying, Your words are very true, but also the immortals and the mortals refuse to follow the laws of the land. I can't even understand this current reality. I think it's the nature of living beings. Garam responded, that's not true, and this shouldn't happen. Veltol continued, someone like me must be the supreme leader at the top so that there is no more conflict between weak individuals. This is the peace I aspire to achieve. Garam retorted, Peace cannot be achieved this way. Veltol said, You should be the one to understand this the most, given what happened to you. Garam replied, No, I should not accept this. Veltol noted, You and I have never had an agreement. Garam acknowledged, I've known that for 500 years. We've always been like this. He then stood up and walked away, thanking Veltol for the meal and the time he spent talking with him. Veltol began to talk to himself, stating that there was no other hero, and that when he was present, Garam should also be there. He believed they would meet at the end of their journey. As Veltol continued his movements in the city, he saw Takashi standing with a large man, discussing something. Takashi asked the large man to confront the Yakuza. The large man replied that if she wanted that, she would have to pay him more than that. Takashi asked him, Why are you so scared when you have such a big body, but it seems you don't have a brain? The large man warned her to be polite with him to avoid any harm, raising his hands towards her. At that moment, Veltol intervened. The large man asked, 
Who are you? Veltal replied. Get away from her and don't come near her, the large man threatened. You're going to get beaten up instead of her. Takashi urged Veltal. Run away! But Veltal reassured her. Don't worry. It's time to see the strength of my one million followers. He struck the large man and pushed him away with a single blow. Takashi, concerned, asked, Are you okay? Veltal replied, Yes, I'm perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with me. He then asked her, Are you okay? Takashi responded, Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Veltal asked Takashi about the man she had been talking to. She replied that he was her personal bodyguard. Veltal apologized for hitting him, explaining that he hadn't been aware of his status. Takashi reassured him that it was no problem. She had dismissed him and found a replacement. At that moment, Veltal had an idea. Are you referring to me? Takashi replied with determination, Yes. Will you accept? I'll give you a salary as well. The scene shifted to another location, where Marcus was speaking with his deputy. He inquired about certain tasks and how they were progressing. The deputy responded that everything was going well, and that they were working on a new project in their areas. Marcus expressed interest, stating that he intended to visit those locations in person. Meanwhile, the camera returned to Veltal and Takashi. Veltal asked her about the nature of the mission she wanted his help with. Her response was surprising. She revealed that it involved theft. Veltal soon deduced that she wanted him to attract attention while she slipped in to carry out the theft. Veltal admired her cleverness, expressing his appreciation for her thinking. However, he inquired if she was sure about the item she wanted to steal. Takashi confirmed that she would verify its presence once she arrived at their target location. But things did not proceed as planned. Veltal quickly rushed over to break the door, demanding everyone's attention. Then he apologized for what he did. Veltal leaned in asking Takashi if the item she planned to steal was the small cube. She confirmed with surprise, wondering how he recognized it without having a familia. Feltal revealed he'd used some magic to acquire certain familia traits, then informed her that their enemies were few, and he intended to take them down. Takashi quickly urged him not to kill them, to which he replied, I know, but I'll show them the power of my million followers. As they approached, one gang member spotted Feltal, asking who he was. Feltal introduced himself in his usual broadcast style, but none of them recognized him. Undeterred, he warned them he was about to demonstrate his power, readying himself for a fight. A gang member scoffed, calling him girly because of his long hair. Feltal shrugged off the insult, remarking it was nothing compared to the comments he faced online. Just then, a gang member raised a weapon at Feltal, but he quickly cast a spell, blocking every attack aimed his way. The gang was left stunned by his strength. Claiming it was now his turn, Feltal swiftly took down the gang with ease, with Takashi giving him a small hand. When it was over, Feltal casually informed Takashi that all enemies were taken care of. Impressed, she remarked on his feat of defeating the Yakuza without weapons, calling him the true Lord of Demons and expressing her eagerness to join him. Feltal warned her to stay back, explaining that he'd accidentally triggered the city guardian's alarm with one of the gang's weapons, setting off an explosion nearby. Takashi's eyes widened as she saw the city guardian appear, a massive weapon known as Magino, usually reserved for city officials, not the Yakuza. Feltal admitted it was his first encounter with such a guardian, but he took it as a chance to test his true strength. He launched an attack, but his strikes had no effect. The guardian responded with its own assault, missing Feltal by a narrow margin. When their their ranged attacks proved ineffective, they switched to close combat, drawing swords in a fierce head-to-head -head fight. During the clash, the Guardian managed to decapitate Feltal, declaring victory. Yet to its surprise, Feltal's voice rang out as he reattached his head, summoning a new sword to continue the battle. In shock, the Guardian demanded to know how this was possible. Feltal responded with a swift, powerful strike, severing the Guardian's limbs and ultimately overpowering it. He told the fallen guardian to report him as undefeatable and to update the records. As Feltal emerged, Takashi approached, stunned by what she'd just seen. Did you really survive being decapitated? She asked, still in disbelief. Yep, Feltal replied casually. Takashi frowned. You're taking this way too lightly. This is serious. Feltal admitted he was actually more surprised by the guardian's fearsome design, but Takashi corrected him saying, No, you're the terrifying one. You took down a city guardian on your own, and since it was tied to HMI, the gang I was planning to rob must have serious connections. I think I'm in bigger trouble than I realized. Unfazed, Feltal asked Takashi about the purpose of the cube. She explained that it was a data storage device containing sensitive files her boss wanted retrieved, but she had promised to review the contents first. Activating the cube, she scanned through its data as a list of names appeared. Feltal immediately recognized them as the Immortals, individuals of great power, each with their own circle of loyal followers. However, Takashi noticed one name missing, Makina. Feltal shrugged, saying, that's probably for the best. Attempting to get more information, Takashi tried reaching out to her boss, but there was no answer. Frustrated and uneasy, she decided to visit him directly to find out what was going on. Feltal insisted on coming along, noting that the situation now involved the Immortals and required his protection. Upon reaching her boss's building, they entered the elevator. Feltal eagerly asked if he could press the button, 
to which Takashi explained they'd need to press several in sequence as a security measure to reach the boss's floor. Exiting the elevator, she warned Feltal about potential traps around the door. Confidently, Feltal informed her he'd already disabled them all, calling it an easy task. Takashi knocked, but there was no response. Her worry grew as Feltal noticed the door was unlocked and pushed it open. They entered cautiously, and Takashi wrinkled her nose at an unpleasant odor. Feltal's expression darkened. Something's wrong here. Be careful. As they moved further inside, they came upon Takashi's boss slumped in a chair, lifeless. The sight made her recoil in shock. Feltal examined the body closely, realizing he had met the man before, in one of his disguises as a beggar. Takashi explained her boss often took on various appearances to gather information covertly. Feltal's keen eyes noticed the stab wounds, clearly aimed to bypass the man's familiar defenses, a deliberate and lethal strike meant to leave no traces. Judging from the state of the body, Feltal deduced that the boss had been dead for a while. He asked Takashi when she had last seen him, and she replied, a week ago. Feltal concluded he'd likely been killed not long after that. Takashi mentioned that her boss had many enemies but kept backup files hidden around. She searched around and eventually uncovered a computer concealed in a desk drawer fully charged and loaded with files. Initially, she dismissed them as unimportant. Feltal advised her to take a closer look, suggesting she go through them carefully and in order. As she scanned through, Takashi's eyes widened upon seeing the files encrypted in an intricate sequence. Her interest peaked as she muttered her love for hacking, but suddenly, all files disappeared, leaving only one titled, The Eternal Furnace. She opened it to reveal a recorded message from her boss. In the video, he spoke with a grin, saying that if they were watching this, he was already dead. He chuckled, admitting he'd always wanted to say that, which earned a reprimanding eye roll from Takashi. The boss detailed a dark truth about the city's energy. It came from a dangerous source called the Ether Reactor. This reactor drew power from hidden ether lines beneath the city, converting it into electricity and magic. Yet, due to the city's vast size, two ether lines alone weren't enough. To compensate, a device called the Eternal Furnace was created, a grim machine that burned immortals as fuel, transforming their essence into pure ether. Since an immortal's essence was equivalent to thousands of ordinary beings, the stronger the immortal, the greater the energy they could yield. As construction on the Eternal Furnace neared completion, mysterious disappearances plagued the workers, none of whom were ever found. With a heavy heart, the boss revealed that those working with HMI began referring to immortals as mere logs for the furnace, and systematically hunted them as fuel. Their first victim had been an ancient and formidable servant of the Six Dark Lords. Three months earlier, the boss had managed to gather information from an HMI insider but narrowly escaped, and since then, security tightened, cutting off his access. The boss had hired Takashi to dig up information on the Yakuza and retrieve the cube to check which immortals were being targeted as fuel. He suspected that the furnace was running low on logs, and that soon the city would be desperate for immortals to sustain its energy needs. Expressing his hope to destroy the Eternal Furnace, he concluded that only the Lord of Demons, the former leader of the Immortals, held the power to put an end to this vicious cycle. With that, the video ended. Feltal looked to Takashi, asking what their next move would be. Are you planning to upload this video online? He asked, cautioning. They'd quickly remove it and track you down. Takashi acknowledged the danger, agreeing with his assessment. Feltal, resolute, told her, Then leave this to me. It's my responsibility as the leader of the Immortals. I'll protect them and end this once and for all. Takashi agreed but insisted on reporting her boss's death to the city guard, saying, We can't just leave him here, another forgotten corpse. Feltal nodded, and as they left the apartment and stepped into the elevator, he mentioned needing to contact Makina. As he dialed, his expression shifted to one of deep concern, signaling something troubling about Makina's situation. Drawn watched from outside Makina's house as she sat inside, contemplating what meal to prepare for Fletal's return. Suddenly the doorbell rang, and when she opened the door, she found Marcus standing there. Without hesitation, she struck him with her magical force, pushing him away from her house. Marcus noted her newfound strength, impressed that she could hit him without causing harm to herself. Makina, now transformed into one of the Dark Warriors, coldly responded that he came to destroy her and deserved to die as a traitor to his people and his leader, Fleetal. They clashed in a fierce magical duel, and amidst the chaos of an explosion, Makina seized Marcus's arm, slicing part of it off. Marcus remained unfazed, commenting on her power as his arm regrew. He launched another attack, but Makina skillfully deflected his blows, even as Marcus set off another explosion. Despite the destruction around her, Makina remained unharmed. She then informed her familiars that Marcus would be held accountable for all the damage. At that moment, Marcus's deputy appeared, attempting to strike Makina with her sword. Makina dodged, unscathed, and quickly moved out of her path. She retaliated with a magical attack on the deputy, but Marcus countered her magic, allowing the deputy to sneak up from behind and stab Makina, sending her crashing to the ground. 
The deputy warned Marcus not to underestimate Machina, suggesting they could have neutralized her familiars earlier to avoid unnecessary losses. Marcus, apologizing, admitted he enjoyed the challenge. Turning to Makina, Marcus coldly confessed that he never liked her, considering her weak and insignificant. Seeing her lifeless body brought him satisfaction. Weakened and hurt, Makina asked what he had done to her. Marcus revealed that he had neutralized her familiars and taken control over them. Makina demanded to know how he managed that insisting her familiars were beyond his reach and fully protected. Marcus explained that he had created a new, advanced type of familiar, capable of infiltrating and controlling any other familiar. With this power, he could dominate Makina's familiars, rendering them incapable of disobeying his commands. As the sole possessor of this superior familiar, he declared himself the strongest man in the world, immune to any interference. Makina asked him what he planned to do with all that power. Marcus revealed his ambition, to become the true Lord of Demons, to control the world, and eliminate Fleetall to take his place. He believed that with the power of information and technology, he could attain immortality and rule forever. Machina tried to rise, but Marcus pressed his foot down on her, preventing her from moving. He informed her that it was time for her to become a foundational energy source for the city. Meanwhile, Fleetall and Takashi returned to Machina's house shocked by the sight of the area ablaze, with signs of an explosion everywhere. Flaytal noticed Machina's gaming controller lying on the ground, feeling a deep sense of foreboding as memories of their time together rushed back. Takashi mentioned hearing rumors about a large explosion in the area, but no one was sure whether it was accidental or intentional. Fletal, concerned, asked how they could find out more. Takashi pointed to a drone hovering above them, suggesting they could gather more information through it. Taking charge, she hacked into all the drones in the area and accessed footage from the drone near Makina's house, capturing the entire magical battle, Marcus's confrontation with Makina, and the location where his deputy had hidden behind the house. Takashi deduced that Marcus had personally handled the situation, meaning they had likely taken Makina as a fuel source. Fletal thanked her for the valuable information and prepared to leave. Takashi stopped him, warning that he couldn't handle the mission alone, as the location would be heavily fortified. While admitting her own weakness in combat, she offered to guide him on the right path. Fletal reassured her, saying he knew someone skilled in fighting who could help. Takashi then asked Fletal if Makina could be dead. Fletal firmly responded, no, and set off to meet Graham, telling him the full story and pleading for his help. Fletal even knelt before Graham in desperation. Graham, recalling the suffering demons had caused him by killing his family, destroying his lands, and causing chaos, found it absurd that Fletal would now ask him to save a single person from his own kin. He argued that Makina was meant to power the city, which he saw as beneficial, and dismissed the idea as unreasonable. Fletal stood up, calling Graham irrational and foolish. Confident, he declared that he would proceed with or without Graham's help, as he was the demon lord and the rightful ruler of the world. Even without an army or followers, he urged Graham to join him, saying that a true hero would make a difference. After a tense exchange, Graham finally agreed to help, not because of Fletal's title, but because a woman was in need of rescue, and it was a hero's duty to intervene. They shook hands, solidifying their alliance. Surprised by their newfound alliance, both Fletal and Graham headed to an abandoned area to reach Makina's location swiftly and stealthily, hoping to avoid Marcus's guards. Fletal contacted Takashi, requesting a map for better navigation. Graham, surprising Fletal, revealed a spell he had created to guide them, explaining he had developed it during his adventures. Their conversation grew heated, as Fletal accused Graham of stealing the spell, claiming it wasn't rightfully his, and was meant to guide travelers. Takashi interrupted, reminding them of the urgency to rescue Makina. Fletal quickly denied any friendship with Graham, declaring them enemies, and Graham agreed noting they could kill each other at any time. Takashi, frustrated, yelled at them to focus on the mission. Graham finished the map, showing a safe and quick route to reach Makina without encountering guards. Fletal suggested putting their differences aside for Makina's sake, and asked Takashi for an update on her progress. She admitted she needed more time, as this was her first time hacking something so difficult, and she wasn't sure she could finish in time. Fletal encouraged her, saying she was strong and capable, boosting her confidence. Meanwhile, Graham and Fletal entered an elevator. Graham remarked that the eternal furnace awaited them at the bottom. Suddenly, their connection with Takashi was lost. Graham commented on Fletal's growth, saying he had become stronger than before. Fletal dismissed this, claiming he was weaker than before. But Graham insisted that Fletal had changed. He pointed out that Fletal had once cared for no one, but now he was willing to kneel to save a single life showing his true strength. As they reached the bottom of the elevator, the doors opened to reveal Marcus's deputy, who was waiting beside the Eternal Furnace. She greeted Fledall, saying she had been expecting him. Graham noted that they'd have to put in some effort to deal with her.
Makina appeared bound by Marcus with extraordinarily strong ropes, her immense strength unable to break free. Confused, she asked Marcus where she was. He revealed they were in the center of the city, pointing to the ethereal furnace, an eternal fire that powered the city using fuel made from immortals. Makina, stunned, questioned him. Am I here to be burned, just like you did to our old friends? Marcus coldly replied that they had been a significant source of energy for the city and so would she. He added that he wanted to reunite with them in the furnace. Furious, Makina called him a traitor, insisting he didn't deserve to be one of them. Flames erupted around her, but Marcus effortlessly deflected them, remarking on her deep hatred toward him, which he claimed he could no longer bear. Makina asked, Do you even realize what you're doing? This is a grave mistake. Marcus affirmed he was fully aware, and explained that while immortals never truly die, throwing them into the ethereal furnace would consume their souls until they were utterly destroyed. Their physical forms might perish, but their existence would be extinguished. Marcus saw this as the perfect opportunity. He then asked her, Do you remember our friend Zanol? He was the first one we used in this furnace. I also gathered other immortals from our village, even our relatives. Zanol suffered unimaginable pain as his body burned until he met his end. Watching it was indescribable. Makina, enraged, struggled again against her bindings and vowed to burn Marcus as he had done to others, showing him no mercy. Marcus mocked her feigning fear, and said, How terrifying! But why won't you help power this city and provide its people with comfort and luxury? Makina, her anger mounting, asked, So you want to turn me into fuel for this furnace? Marcus confirmed it without hesitation, adding that only a few individuals in the MHI Corporation knew about the ethereal furnace. He explained that if the truth about the furnace reached the city's people, a small number might advocate for the immortals' lives, but that wasn't in anyone's best interest. Sacrificing immortals ensured the rest of the population could enjoy a comfortable life. With energy supplies dwindling, Marcus considered Makina's capture fortunate. Her immense power, as one of these six demons, would sustain the city long enough for them to find an alternative energy source. He stressed that stopping the ethereal furnace would halt the city entirely, which couldn't be allowed to happen. Meanwhile, Marcus's deputy met with Fletal and Graham. She informed them that Marcus had anticipated Fletal's arrival and tasked her with stopping him. However, she hadn't expected him to bring a friend along. She turned to Graham and confirmed, You must be Graham, aren't you? He replied, Yes, you know me. It's an honor to meet you. She responded, Of course, your name is recorded in our archives. You're known for never aging and for being a legendary hero who fought valiantly in the Second War, but seeing you two together is quite intriguing. Graham declared to Flaytal, I will handle her. I still possess my unique skills. Don't worry. I'll complete this mission. Flaytal replied confidently, I'm sure you will. I'm not worried about you, but be cautious. She might be far more skilled than you expect, and her swordsmanship rivals Zinal's. Graham, preparing for battle, said, Let's see how strong she really is. If she's like Zinal, this will be easy. The deputy interjected, What are you saying? Graham responded, I fought against Zinal in a war and defeated him. I cannot lose to someone of his caliber. Flaytal confirmed, He's telling the truth. The deputy, now ready to fight, retorted, These are just delusions clouding your mind. She swiftly moved behind Graham and struck at him with her sword. However, Graham parried her attack, leaving her astonished. Meanwhile, Flaytal rushed off to rescue Makina from Marcus. The deputy attempted to chase him, but Graham blocked her path. The deputy shouted to Flaytal, You're running from me. Turning to Graham, she added, And you're standing in my way. Flaytal replied, You won't catch me. To Graham, he said, Remember this, don't die. He then leapt downward, using a levitation spell to glide through the air. Graham acknowledged, Understood. The deputy taunted Graham, Your time is over. You're a relic of the distant past. He countered, Perhaps, but I will always volunteer to be a hero in any era. She smirked. Then it's time Time to erase you from all records and timelines. I need to hurry to Marcus to deliver my results. She cast a transformation spell, donning full armor, and launched a powerful strike slamming Graham into a building. However, he emerged unscathed. Graham remarked, This is a protective shield, the deputy confirmed. Indeed, it's a new shield manufactured by Magino and developed by our company. It's equipped with advanced weaponry for immediate use. Graham observed, This must be a fifth-generation prototype. It's not yet available on the market. She nodded. Correct. The fourth generation is currently in circulation, but this fifth-generation model has been improved with greater speed a more compact design, and enhanced ports. It represents the future of this nation. However, compared to the fourth generation, it has one flaw. Its operational time is limited, relying minimally on enchantments. As she spoke, she attacked Graham, swiftly striking from above with her sword. Graham deflected her blow as they battled in mid-air. She unleashed a flurry of attacks, but none managed to break through his defense. The deputy sneered, Your weapon is ancient, and the familiar system you rely on is outdated. With this armor, I'm far stronger than you. Graham calmly replied, Battles aren't determined by weapons or age. They're about winners and losers, and I don't believe I'll be the one to lose. She said to him, Then let's see. She struck him with the power of lightning, but he blocked it. She readied her sword again and unleashed a similar strike 
praising his resilience. The impact pushed him back, but he remained unaffected. Graham replied, Your enhancements show no apparent weaknesses, and they are indeed formidable. As she attacked him from above, he noted, It's impressive, but I'm glad these upgrades didn't exist during my battles in the old era. He added, Your speed isn't remarkable and your magic is only active when your sword is drawn from its sheath. The deputy admitted, That's correct. I expected you to notice this in combat, but it doesn't matter because there's a vast difference in our strength and abilities. It's time to end this. She launched another attack, striking multiple times in succession, but none of her blows landed. Her frustration grew as he blocked every attempt effortlessly. She questioned herself, Can I not land a single hit on him? She continued her relentless assault, managing only to cut a small strand of his hair. Still, she couldn't wound or weaken him. Graham eventually immobilized her sword by stepping on it. He cast a ground-based spell to harm her, but she overcame it and countered his attack. He then froze her leg and leapt high into the air, aiming to strike her with his sword. She managed to block the blow, but Graham quickly followed with a fireball spell, hitting her and forcing her back with visible damage. Enraged, she returned, more furious than before. Graham calmly said, I haven't broken through yet, even though I'm employing brilliant tactics in this battle. I've identified your vulnerabilities. These spells I'm using, I haven't relied on them in over five centuries. To me, you're an easy target, she retorted. Don't underestimate me. She attacked once more, but he parried and struck her with his sword. He followed up with a kick that pushed her back again, fueling her anger. She accused, your sword is far too old to counter my strikes. He replied, This sword isn't old. It's timeless. I've refined it over the years, and I assure you, you wouldn't withstand even one of its full strikes. Summoning her strength, she launched another powerful attack. Graham raised his sword, enchanted it with a spell, and delivered a devastating blow. The strike shattered her defenses, injuring her shoulder, and leaving her unable to continue. Graham emerged victorious. As she sat on the ground, weakened by his blow, he said, Your armor is excellent but my strength wasn't at its peak, like when I fought the Demon Lord. Even so, I'm surprised by what transpired, she asked. Why did I lose? He replied, why not ask instead how I won? She responded, it's the same thing. He corrected her, perhaps, but victory also comes with experience. Believe me, centuries of combat bring valuable lessons. She dismissed his words feeling sorrow over her defeat. That means nothing, she said. He countered, I have 500 years of experience. This outcome was inevitable. The deputy speculated, I suppose you're here to confront Marcus. I don't believe Flaytal can handle him alone. He's not strong enough. Graham refuted her. Don't underestimate him. Flaytal has devised a plan to take down Marcus. She warned, Marcus is incredibly powerful, and his familia is advanced beyond comprehension. Graham reassured her, I trust Flaytal. He'll defeat him. Take this advice from someone who has bested you. She then asked, Will you kill me? Graham replied, No. I have no reason to. You couldn't handle a fight against me, so why would I kill you? I'm only here to stop you from interfering with Flaytal. Suddenly, flames descended from above, targeting both Graham and the deputy. He shielded them both as mechanical beings emerged from the sky, landing near them. Graham prepared himself to eliminate the new threat. Meanwhile, Marcus was strangling Machina, throwing her toward the eternal furnace. As she fell, memories of Flaytal flashed before her eyes. Just as she neared the furnace's end, Flaytal appeared, rescuing her and apologizing for his delay. 